Sadness and outrage tonight after another school shooting in America. Good afternoon, this is News 2, and we're following a breaking story today of shooting at a high school in Littleton, Colorado. There is word potentially multiple children have been killed. This happened at the Robb Elementary School in the Uvalde Consolidated Independence School District. The 12th Colorado Movie Theater Massacre. Seven bodies were discovered in Oklahoma. Two mosques in Christchurch were targeted, the country's worst mass shooting ever. Hello everyone, I'm back today with part 6 of my Halloween series. I do hope you enjoy it. Today's case was heart-wrenching, with a lot of twists and turns leading to an undesirable outcome. Without further ado, let's dive into the case. On August 16, 1960, David and Dorothy Moxley gave birth to their daughter, Martha Elizabeth Moxley in San Francisco, California. She had a brother named John who was about two years older than her. Martha was a beautiful kid with a great personality. Martha never had trouble making friends growing up, as she was extremely friendly and extroverted. Only about a year before her murder, Martha and her family moved across the country to the Connecticut coast from California in the summer of 1974. There, they lived in the quiet and seemingly safe private neighborhood of Bell Haven in Greenwich, Connecticut. This area was renowned for its lack of violent crime, which made it a desirable place to live. It didn't take long for Martha to warm up to her surroundings. Martha was very popular and quickly became well-liked within the community. According to CNN, within nine months of her move to Connecticut, Martha was voted the most popular girl in her junior high school. Her older brother, John, described her, quote, Martha was a person who had everything in the world going for her. She was friendly, she was athletic, she was talented in the arts. Everything seemed to come very easily to Martha. She was very easy to get along with, upbeat, friendly, the kind of kid you'd like to be around. Despite her popularity, Martha was still very family-oriented, opting to stay home and enjoy time with her family a lot of the time. Martha was not perfect, though. She also reportedly had a wild side. On occasion, Martha would act out, sometimes getting caught drinking and missing curfew. Anyway, Upon moving to the neighborhood, Martha began to attend the exclusive Bell Haven Club, which as far as I can tell, is similar to a country club type thing. Martha spent the summer there swimming and playing tennis. She met a lot of the neighborhood teens there and quickly began to make friends. Let's skip forward to the last night of Martha's life. On the night of October 30th, 1975, 15-year-old Martha Moxley set out on a night full of Halloween festivities with her friends. They planned on participating in Mischief Night, an event that many of the neighborhood teenagers would take part in. Mischief Night consisted of activities such as ding-dong ditching, toilet papering houses, and other harmless pranks. According to Oxygen.com, Martha had been grounded in the days leading up to this night after she stayed out past her curfew. Her mother, Dorothy, later said that the only reason Martha was allowed to go out that night was because it was the night before Halloween. There were two brothers in Martha's immediate friend group, 15-year-old Michael Skakel and 17-year-old Thomas Skakel. The Skakel family consisted of Father Rushton Skakel and his seven children. Rushton's wife and the children's mother, Ann Skakel, unfortunately passed away from cancer in 1973, two years before the events of today's case. Apparently, after Ann's death, the Skakel family fell apart. Rushton was an alcoholic that seemed to never be home, his seven children were often left in the care of family members, friends, or even left to fend for themselves. Around the time of the case, the Skakel house was in shambles. Friends of the family reported that the home was filled with alcohol, drugs, and intense sibling rivalries. Despite these difficulties, the family was able to somewhat stay afloat. The Skakels were a very wealthy family. Rushton's sister, Ethel, actually ended up marrying John F. Kennedy's brother, Robert Kennedy, in 1950. Not only were the Skakels practically related to the Kennedys, but Rushton had also inherited a fortune from the family's mining company. The Skakels were well known in the community and quickly became friends with the Moxley family when they moved into the house across the street. Martha was reportedly closest friends with Michael and Thomas Skakel, although she was friendly with all seven siblings. Back to the events of October 30th, 1975. According to her friends, 15-year-old Martha and 17-year-old Thomas Skakel spent most of the night flirting, 
and they even apparently kissed. At some point during the evening, Martha and a few friends went to hang out at the Skakel residence. Later that night, all of the friends went home, leaving Martha alone with the brothers. It was around 9 p.m. that evening when Martha was last seen alive by her friends. When she didn't return home when she was supposed to, her family grew worried and alerted the police of her possible disappearance. Martha's mom, Dorothy, told 48 Hours, quote, I was getting more and more worried. It just wasn't like her. Her family also began to call around to Martha's friends, and this was when they learned that she had last been seen with the Skakel brothers. Martha's mom proceeded to call the Skakel residence, but she was informed by Tommy that Martha wasn't at their house. I also read that at some point, she went over to the Skakel home, which was right across the street. Apparently, Dorothy had never actually been to the house before this. This also ended up not being fruitful, as she wasn't able to gather any more information regarding her daughter's whereabouts. The questions about where Martha was lingered into the next day. Still, no one had seen or heard from her. That was until the afternoon hours, on Halloween, when a gruesome discovery was made. Martha's lifeless and brutally beaten body was found near the back of her family's property under a tree. The police were called immediately, and when they arrived, they determined that she had been killed between 9.30 and 10 p.m. the night before. Investigators were able to follow a trail of blood leading from Martha's body to the Moxley driveway. It was there that in the grass, they located the probable murder weapon, a Tony Pena 6 iron golf club that was broken into many pieces. They also found a large amount of blood in the immediate area. Police determined that Martha was attacked near the driveway and was dragged through the lush grass, where she was left, as there was a visible trail leading to the spot where her body was found. Upon the examination of her body, it was determined that Martha had been beaten so hard with the golf club that it shattered into pieces. It was also found that she was stabbed through the neck with the broken and jagged shaft of the golf club. After gathering information from Martha's family and friends, police also learned that she had last been seen with the Skakel brothers, Michael and Tommy. Investigators quickly tracked the Skakel brothers down in order to get their accounts of the night before. Michael Skakel claimed that he, his brother Tommy and Martha were all hanging out at their house on the night of October 30th, 1975. He stated that at about 9.30 p.m., he left Tommy and Martha at the house while he went to his cousin, Jimmy Terrian's house. He then told them that he returned home at around 11.30 p.m. and went straight to bed. According to this story, 17-year-old Tommy Skakel was the last known person to be with Martha. Tommy quickly became their main suspect, but when they were able to speak with him, he said that Martha left to go home shortly after Michael left, around 9.30. Police also spoke with the Skakel family tutor, Ken Littleton, and he said that he was watching TV with Tommy in the home at around 10 p.m. According to Ken, nothing seemed off about Tommy or his behavior. Tommy also took a lie detector test, which he passed. Polygraphs are not 100% accurate though, so it doesn't completely exonerate him. With the passing of the test, no physical evidence, and the fact that Tommy had an alibi, the police had no merit to arrest Tommy. However, police were able to trace the broken golf club back to the Skakel residence. During a search of the home, they found a matching set of golf clubs that belonged to their deceased mother. Still, even with this finding, there was no further physical evidence to connect anyone in the family to Martha's murder. During the investigation, police found some potentially concerning entries in Martha's diary. One read, quote, went driving in Tom's car, and I was practically sitting on Tom's lap. He kept putting his hand on my knee. Martha's friends made it clear to police that she was not into Tommy in a romantic sense. They told investigators that although Tommy wanted to date Martha, she never reciprocated the feelings, even shutting down most of his advances. Police made another discovery in Martha's diary. On October 4th, 1975, a little over three weeks before her death, Martha wrote, quote, I went to a party. Tom S. was being an ass. At the dance, he kept putting his arms around me and making moves. These entries, while mildly concerning, were obviously not enough to arrest Tommy still. At most, these writings suggested that Tommy may have been a little pushy towards Martha, but that didn't mean that he killed her. They also found an entry about Tommy's younger brother, Michael, which read, quote, 
Michael was so totally out of it that he was being a real ass in his actions and words. He kept telling me that I was leading Tom on, when I don't like him, except as a friend. Michael jumps to conclusions. I really have to stop going over there. From these writings, we can see that Martha was already starting to pull away from the Skakels. Their behavior was obviously starting to make her feel uneasy. I'm not sure what happened between them since writing the diary entries, but she must have felt comfortable enough being around them again if she willingly went to their house on the night of October 30th, 1975. Anyway, the Skakel family up until this point had been cooperative with investigators, even allowing them to perform that search on the home after the murder. This didn't last long though, because on January 22nd, 1976, Rushton Skakel stopped cooperating with police. Around this time, all leads fizzled out, and the police no longer had anything to go off of. Frustratingly, the case would go cold for a number of years. Sadly, before he got any answers about his daughter's death, David Moxley passed away from a sudden heart attack in 1988. Still, years went on with no new leads or information. That was until 1995, when a document was leaked from an investigation ordered by Rushton Skakel. I'm not entirely sure what the investigation was about, but it obviously had something to do with the murder. According to CBSNews.com, Tommy admitted that he lied about the events of the night. Suddenly, he confessed that he was with Martha at 9.30, the time investigators believe she was killed. Tommy claimed that he and Martha were outside making out for about 20 minutes, calling it a semi-sexual encounter. He, however, did not confess to harming Martha in any way. Tommy wasn't the only one to change his story. According to CBSNews.com, the leaked document stated that Michael Skakel apparently also lied to the police during his first recounting of events. This time, he said that upon his return home from his cousin's house, he didn't go straight to bed. Instead, he claimed that he went back out, climbed a tree outside of Martha's bedroom window, and masturbated. During a later book proposal, Michael recounted the events of the night in detail. He said that they were hanging out with friends at the home and there was alcohol and drugs involved. I'm unsure if he confirmed that Martha used them, but I know that Michael admitted that he did. He then went on to say, quote, I wanted to kiss her. I wanted her to be my girlfriend, but I was going slow, being careful. The truth is that with Martha, I felt a little shy. I thought that maybe if we spent the evening together at my cousin's, something romantic might develop between us. When he asked, Martha declined the offer to go to his cousin's house, stating she had a curfew that she had to follow. So, Michael apparently went alone, and then came back before climbing the tree and masturbating. Despite this new apparent timeline, Michael still maintained his innocence regarding Martha's death. An audio recording that Michael made also came out, where he described the night's events in great detail. Professional statement analyst Wesley Clark listened to and analyzed Michael's recording. Apparently, Michael said that the night was full of adrenaline and fun. He also described his initial encounter with Martha that night. According to Clark, Michael's statements were very descriptive and had sensory detail, which indicated that it was coming from memory. Clark went on to state that when Michael described how he felt after finding out Martha was murdered close to the tree he climbed that night, he spoke with no emotion. Clark also said that Michael seemed more concerned with the fact that people would think he was responsible for her death if he told anyone he was out that night. During this time, many people also came forward with witness statements claiming that Michael had confessed to them about murdering Martha. In 2000, Michael Skakel, now 41, was formally charged with Martha's murder. I wasn't able to find a definitive answer as to why they leaned more towards Michael when Tommy was not able to be fully ruled out, but nevertheless, Michael was charged. Two years later, in 2002, his trial began. The prosecution alleged that Michael had feelings for Martha and was jealous about her relationship with his older brother, Tommy. They used some of her diary entries as well as his quotes from the book proposal to push this possibility. According to the prosecution's theory, Michael became so jealous that he killed her while in a drunken rage. The prosecution brought in multiple witnesses who all testified that Michael allegedly made incriminating statements about murdering Martha. Even though they were not directly involved in the case, the Kennedys came to Michael's aid. Both his aunt, Ethel, and her son, Robert Jr., rallied behind Michael, writing in multiple letters begging for leniency during his trial. The jury deliberated for four days 
and came back with a guilty verdict. Michael was convicted and sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. After his conviction, Martha's mother Dorothy told interviewers that the day felt like a dream and she feared she would wake up. Martha's older brother John also said that he was relieved that someone was finally convicted of her murder. After Michael was put in prison, his cousin, Robert Kennedy Jr., was dedicated to supporting him. Robert complained that Michael was not represented fairly in his trial, as his attorney failed to call a crucial witness to the stand. This witness would have been able to confirm Michael's original alibi, that he was miles away at his cousin's home at the time of Martha's death. It was also alleged that Michael's older brother Tommy, or even the tutor, Ken Littleton, could have as easily been the culprit. Robert Kennedy Jr. told 48 Hours, quote, I know Michael Skakel, and I know that he didn't commit this crime. Michael Skakel spent over a decade in prison until 2013, when he was ultimately granted a new trial on the grounds that his first attorney failed to adequately represent him. This decision was upheld by the Connecticut Supreme Court. This legal battle lasted years, in which Martha's family was ripped of their peace and relief. Her family expressed their utter disbelief and disappointment during the appeal process. After the lengthy battle, in October of 2020, the Connecticut State's attorney announced that they would not attempt to retry Michael Skakel for the murder of Martha Moxley. So as of now, Michael is a free man, living a somewhat normal, low-key life. As of the time of this video, today marks 48 years since Martha was brutally murdered. She still has no definite justice after all of these decades and her family and friends are still left without conclusive answers as to what happened to her that night. Unless someone comes forward with any new information regarding the case, it's possible that Martha's murder may go unsolved indefinitely. I'm not sure if the police have any other leads to follow at this time, but I will remain hopeful that someday, Martha will get the justice she deserves. Thank you guys for watching to the end of this video. I'm curious to know what you guys think about the case as a whole. Do you think Michael was falsely convicted? Or do you think he ultimately got away with murder? Do you think that Tommy could have been involved in Martha's death? Or maybe even the tutor, Ken? Is it at all possible that her murder was committed by someone completely unrelated? It seems unlikely as the golf club was traced back to the Skakel home. Anyway, please let me know what your thoughts are. No matter what your opinions are regarding this case, please keep your comments respectful. I hope you enjoyed today's video. And I'll be back with one more episode tomorrow to round off the Halloween series. Thank you so much for the ongoing support, and I'll be back to my usual content soon.